Zechariah 1, and then we did Zechariah 3 and 4, because the Lord was calling for the restoration of his house in Zechariah. And then we looked at Ezra, uh, and when they went back, so historically, you guys should all know this by now, but historically, uh, Israel or Judah was taken captive to, uh, to Babylon, so they stayed there 70 years, and after the end of the 70-year captivity, uh, Cyrus of Persia decreed that Israel could go back and to rebuild the temple. That storyline around both the warnings of the impending judgment in their generation, the 70-year captivity in Babylon, the release of the Jewish people back to Jerusalem to build, uh, rebuild Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple, that storyline takes up so much of the Old Testament narrative. Uh, so many of the prophets uh, were talking about these events that were going to happen. And so it's a highlight in the Old Testament. And what God was talking about was rebuilding the temple that Solomon had built. The, temple, the first temple was built by Solomon. David prepared it. Now the foundation of that temple was the tabernacle of David, which was when he brought in the ark into Jerusalem, and he pitched a tent for it in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 16. He pitched, a, he pitched a tent for it. And then he hired musicians and singers to worship night and day and to pray with the open ark in Jerusalem. It was unheard of. Because at that time, you had the tabernacle of Moses, right, where the ark was actually concealed from the nation. It was concealed from people. Okay? And it was, it was in the Holy of Holies. And so God broke through that dividing line, that veil. He broke it, and it's a picture for us in the New Testament where we can have fellowship, where we can receive, uh, re enjoy God's presence, and we can have relationship with him in an open way. And so that was the foundation, the tabernacle of David, for the temple. Well, because of Israel's disobedience, God sends the nation of, of Babylon to come and to wipe out Jerusalem. They wipe out Jerusalem over 20 years, and then they destroy the temple in 586 BC, and then they're marched 700 miles to Babylon. And so for 70 years, God's judgment is upon Jerusalem and the temple. And for 70 years, this is when Daniel and Ezekiel are prophesying while in Babylon. Well, the nation of uh, Persia, Medo-Persia, they conquer Babylon uh, right at the end. And then Cyrus, a heathen king, he's the king, he would be modern-day Iran, he releases by decree the Jews to go back and to rebuild their temple. And so we were looking at that narrative in Ezra, chapter 4, okay, and how God raised up the prophets because the Jews had come back about 50,000 Jews came back to Jerusalem. They started to build the temple. They laid the foundation. And then because of opposition and discouragement, they stopped. Imagine you go back and you, you sacrifice and you travel 700 miles to go back and to build the temple. And you start with zeal, but because of discouragement and opposition, you stop. Okay. You st and they stopped, and they stopped for 16 years. Okay. And so then, then they got into, this, uh, into the lifestyle of building their own houses and, to, and their own lifestyles. For 16 years, they stopped. And so G God raises up the prophetic voices, Haggai and Zechariah. He raises them up, and he sends them to go and to encourage Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest, to go encourage them, saying, this is God's vision for his house. He, he reprimands them, calls them to repentance, and to re, and start building their, the house. The, the temple is the house of prayer in their generation. Okay, that the temple is the house of prayer in their generation. And we know that because in Isaiah 56, in verse 7, Isaiah is prophesying about the house of prayer, about the temple, and he calls it, the house of prayer for all nations, for all peoples. It says he'll make you joyful in his house. It talks about foreigners coming into that house and ministering to the Lord. He's declaring it in Isaiah 56, verse 7. 
And then Jesus in Matthew 21 says he comes and he you know, overturns the money change, uh, the tables and he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, Matthew 21, 13. And so the Old Testament temple is a New Testament house of prayer. It's the same reality. And in their generation, they were building or restoring the house of prayer, the temple, in their generation. Now, we looked at Haggai's perspective last week, or maybe a couple weeks ago, right? We looked at Haggai's perspective, and we should look. I love it because in Haggai chapter 2, okay, in Haggai chapter 2 and verse 3, He's asking this question because they they celebrated the laying of the foundation. And as they were celebrating the laying of the foundation, you had both cheers and you had tears at the same time. And so the young ones saw it and they were so excited because they were rebuilding the house of prayer, the temple. The older ones that had seen the glory of Solomon's temple remembered the judgment and what was lost over the 70 years. And they were comparing it going, this is nothing compared to what Solomon had built and the glory that Israel had lost because of their disobedience and God's judgment. And it says that there are cheers there are, you know, and tears at the same time. And in verse 3, just in review, Haggai 2 verse 3, he's asking this question. Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory and I love this question. He's saying, and how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? And the question he's asking is, when you see the foundation of this temple, when you, what do you see? Right? Do you just see the glory that was lost? Or are you seeing or able to see what God sees when he sees the house of prayer? Because it's really important on our vision, our perspective of if we will sacrifice and work, because twice in Haggai, he says, now work, I love that verse, now work, all right, because the Spirit of God's on you and the promises are there. Like he wants us to work, he wants us not to be lazy, but in this case specifically, he's like work in the, build, in the rebuilding of the house of prayer. And the reason why he asks this question is because he jumps from uh, the rebuilding of the second temple, he jumps all the way to the end of the age and he's talking about the continuity of the temple in, in uh, Zerubbabel's day with the temple or the house of prayer at the end of the age. Because he says, what you're building now is connected to what God will establish at the end of the age. There's a continuity in its work. And, the, and he says that that God will begin to shake all the nations, starting in verse 6 and 7, saying God will shake all the nations, and he will actually bring the gold and the glory back into his house at the end of the age. And, he's, and, he, begins, and he begins to prophesy, going, where is both the church and the house of prayer where is it going, and what will you be a part of, and what will you give your efforts and energies to build? That's what he's asking. He's going, even when we look at, when we, I look at it, I go, sometimes you get discouraged. You're like, what are we doing? Like, there's not a lot of people. It seems monotonous sometimes. We're doing the same thing. And, we're, and God's going, what do you see? Do you see an empty room? Do you see a few people? Or do you see the promises of God, how he will restore his house and he will fill it with glory once again throughout the nations? It's like, what are you working for? Like, what, where is your hope in? That's the question he's asking in Haggai. And I love that question because what you see when you see the house of prayer, like in your own minds, in your understanding, what you see is, is what you will project and what you will work for and what you will believe the Lord to do. Okay? And so this is the question that's asked in Haggai. Now, let me say this as well. The house of prayer is the church. Right? And the church or the people of God, it's just all different names and identities. It's the bride. right? It's the body, all these different ideas and, and names. The house of prayer is the, is the church meaning the church's foundation should be one that's built on intimacy, relationship, 
worship, adoration to God, prayer, these, these basic foundations that we've really fallen away from in the, in the American church. And what he says is he's going to restore that type of identity, relationship, upon which he can entrust his power. And so tonight, I'm gonna, we're going to look at one more aspect of the house of prayer, which is uh, in Amos. Okay, so if, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Amos. And so the background of Amos, so we looked at Zechariah, we looked at Ezra, we looked at Haggai, and now we're looking at Amos. And so Amos rose up, he wasn't a prophet, nor a son of a prophet, but the Lord raised him up to prophesy in this nine chapter book, or nine chapter prophecy, between 760 and 753 BC. Meaning, so he was about 150 years, 200 years, before the destruction of Jerusalem, and he was, he brought, he was uh, addressing the sinfulness of northern Israel, a little bit of southern Judah, and the surrounding nations. Okay? And almost all nine chapters of Amos, if you read it, is all about warning and judgment on Israel and the nations. Almost all of it is about judgment. Amos, the nine chapter book. Very interesting. And he, he, this is about 760, in the, well, about 40 years, Assyria, the empire of Assyria, comes and wipes out northern Israel in 721 B.C. And so they didn't heed the warning, and within 40 years, that's not a long time, within 40 years, the 10 tribes of Israel are gone and scattered, never to return. Okay? That's what Jeremiah's uh, reflecting on, or he mentions going, did you see what happened to northern Israel? Judah, did you see how God warned them through Amos, through Isaiah, through others? He goes, if you don't repent, then worse will happen to you, southern Judah. That's what Jeremiah was saying. And so Amos here is warning, the whole nine chapters is all just judgment, judgment, judgment. All right? the warnings and judgment about what's, what's going to come. And then the last five verses of the book, in Amos 9, verse 11 through 15, it's a prophetic declaration of restoration for Israel and the nations. So the whole nine chapters is about judgment. And then at the very end, he goes, but there's hope. Right? This is the prophetic hope that God declares. And here, uh, we'll just look at it here in verse 11. It says, in that day, I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. It says, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows seed. When the mountains will drip sweet, sweet wine and all the hills will be dissolved. Also, I will restore the captivity of my people Israel, and they will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will also plant vineyards and drink their wine and, and make gardens and eat their fruit. Verse 15, I will also plant them on their own land, on their land, and they will not again be rooted out from their land, which I have given them, says the Lord your God. And these five verses have so much prophetic implications for the end of the age. Okay? The prophetic implications or promises really for our generation. Right? This, is be, this will be played out in our generation here. And here in verse 11, he begins by saying that he will restore the tabernacle of David okay? or the fallen booth of David or the fallen tent of David. And in Israel's history, in David's history, there was only one time when David had a tabernacle or a tent. And that was when he brought the ark in, for, and it lasted for 33 years. Okay? There, there was a tabernacle of Moses, but that was different. That's where the ark was, and that's where the daily sacrifices and animal sacrifices and the giving of the law, those things happened uh, at Mount Sinai with the sacrificial system and the tabernacle of Moses. But you, this is unmistakable in what Amos is referencing because there's only been one time in Israel's history when there was a booth or a tent or a tabernacle that David stewarded called the Tabernacle of David. 
And so you can't mistake him what he's talking about. He's really talking about when, when uh, David brought the ark to Jerusalem in 1 Corinthians 13. He brings the ark, he pitches a tent, and he leaves the ark in open sight. And for 33 years, he brings in, the, the verses are here uh, in 1 Corinthians 16. He, he brings in, uh, he anoint, appoints Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord. Okay? And so what he's after is this. He's after the Psalm 132, the dwelling place of God. Okay? And so David's desire and his vow was in Psalm 132, the dwelling place of God. And by the tabernacle of David, he brought forth or established the dwelling place of God. And in doing so, it brought the glories of God to the kingdom of Israel. It was the glory days of David. The victories... Uh, the blessing, the prosperity, the peace, all of that came with the tabernacle of David. Okay. And so it had died down after Solomon. There was division. Uh, Israel was split in two. And, and so Amos stands up and he's prophesying about in that day or in the future day, really at the end of the age. And he says, there's a day coming when the tabernacle of David, like we saw in David's day, will be restored and God will rebuild it and reestablish it. Very interesting, very significant. And what he's saying is that the presence of God or night and day worship and prayer will be the catalyst for what God wants to do at the end of the age. Okay? That's what he's saying here, that this worship movement that we're familiar with right, in the last 25 years or so, we're familiar with it. It really is the catalyst of what God wants to do and will do at the, end, at the end of the age. And we'll look at that some more. Because in verse 12, it says, That tabernacle of David God will raise up to possess the remnant of Edom. Okay? Or it's the descendants of Esau. Or I think in the larger picture, it's talking about the Arab nations. Okay? He says, that tabernacle of David, not just Jesus or Israel, but the tabernacle of David is going to be a catalyst for the salvation of the Arabs as well as all the nations who are called by my name. Right? When you hear all the nations, we should go, wait a second, that sounds like the Great Commission being fulfilled. The Matthew 28, the go of the Great Commission. It sounds like the harvest of all nations. The inheritance from every tongue and tribe for the Son of God is, will be catalyzed by the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David. Okay, you see how significant that is. And then two more things he says here, or other things, but just to highlight, is in verse 14 and 15, it says that and he connects this, the same events in the same time frame. It says in verse 14, he will also re, uh, restore the captivity of his people Israel. And so there will be a restoration of the captivity of Israel, as well as, verse 15, they will be planted in their land, never to be removed again. Now, if you look in verse 15, I'm sure it's in the notes somewhere, but if you look in verse 15, I love this phrase that says, which I have given them. The Lord has given Israel the land by covenant, Genesis 12 and Genesis 15, right? And here he says, I've given them this land. Now, I believe... Uh, so these are different themes that are connected to the promise in Amos 9. Now, I'll tell you, I believe that this restoration of Israel from their captivity has only begun and yet has not been fulfilled. And that 1948 was not a fulfillment of this restoration. Right? It was the beginning part, but there is still to be a, fur a further or final restoration of Israel because there were yet to be another scattering of Israel when the Antichrist comes. When the Antichrist comes, there is a final scattering and then a final regathering of Israel. It's Isaiah 11 talks about that. It's actually what the Isaiah 19 highway is all about, this regathering of Israel. Okay, it's mentioned in multiple places where it's Egypt, Assyria, and Israel, that Isaiah 19 highway is all about the regathering, the restoration of Israel from their captivity. And so, uh, and so there, this is why it's at the end of the age, and we'll see, we'll see this make more sense in Acts 15. 
but it's talking about Israel will be restored from their captivity and they'll be planted in their land never to be rooted out again. And so some people talk about that, that they won't be rooted out now because in 1948, 1967, they're in their land that's flourishing. It seems like it's being restored, but yet there is another great uh, punishment uh, or dispersion coming for Israel still yet to come. And they will be uprooted from their land. It's Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14. It's Jeremiah 30, verse 7, called the, uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, or the great tribulation, Daniel chapter 12. I mean, it's, it's referenced all over the Old Testament prophets. Like, you know, I'm just throwing out verses at you. It's like, it's just all through. It's the storyline of Israel. Okay? And, it's, and it's yet to come, but the glorious promises, it's only for three and a half years. And the promise is, is that in that day, God will bring them back and he will save all Israel, Romans 11, verse 26, and he will bring them into their land never to be rooted out after, after that point. Okay? So I, I know I'm throwing a lot of concepts at you and a lot of things, but you guys are smart. You know, we've talked about this a lot. Okay? And so when you talk about Isaiah 19 okay, and uh, Isaiah 11 and, and, and Jeremiah, I think it's like 51, it's talk, it talks about this, uh, this Isaiah 19 highway of Egypt, Assyria, and Israel multiple times. Many times, actually, in the Old Testament. And, it, and when you see that, it's actually talking about the restoration of Israel because they'll be scattered. And how are they coming back? Well, God is doing a work to prepare the Arab lands with worship, with salvation, and to love Israel and so that they will be saved and restored. And so this is Amos 9. This is the promise of the tabernacle of David, which is really night and day prayer, the house of prayer. That the spirit of the tabernacle of David is what fuels the house of prayer. Okay. You guys with me? Okay. So we just covered all of this. <laughs> okay. Page 2. Uh, we just covered all, all up into page 2. Okay. And so let's just look at letter F real quick. Okay, and so God's strategy is that he will establish night and day prayer for the salvation of the Arabs and for Israel. Okay, he will establish night and day prayer, okay, or the tabernacle of David. He will establish that because what it does is it wars in the heavenlies. When prayer goes up, it wars in the heavenlies. It draws the presence of God. Psalm 132, I want to tie this together. When, when we worship and pray, an altar is established. It draws the presence of God. It's Psalm 22, okay? and it, it builds a spiritual throne. And when that happens, the war in the heavenlies is won, and the st ancient strongholds over these lands are broken. Okay? That's why in the last 20, 30 years, we've seen more Muslims come to faith I mean, in, in the Muslim world, as the house of prayer and, 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 and uh, these altars have been established, we've seen more activity by the Spirit of God and more Muslims. It is really is a revival both among the Arabs and the Gentile and, and Israel in that part of the world in the last 20, 30 years. I mean, what's, what they're seeing, especially in the last 10 years, they only dreamed about 20, 30 years ago. Okay? And it's accelerating right now. I was reading this uh, thing by Joel Rosenberg. They said the Christian population in Israel is increasing, has been increasing every year. They document it, all right, and the numbers they give and how it's been increasing. And they just did the census for this last year and how it's increasing again this last year. All right? There's about, I think, 200,000 Christians or something like that in Israel, uh, in the land of Israel right now. And so what we've seen is in the last you know, 20 years that as, as this altar of worship and prayer has been established as a catalyst among the Arab nations and in Israel, we're seeing God answer. It's a global upper room that he's preparing. And we're seeing the salvation of the Arabs and the Jews coming in record numbers, and yet it will only accelerate as we draw unto that day, the day of the war. Okay. And so it really is a strategy. It's God's strategy. And so when you look back, you're like, oh my goodness, the house of prayer has has exploded in the last 25 years. Not just this dead. He died. So, that's okay. We'll just we'll wait. You guys can do whatever. So, in the last 25 years, what's happened is it's just exploded. Right? Is that not just the movement in Kansas City, but all over the nations is exploding.
exploded, God independently doing it, because it's a strategy for the end of the age. The strategy is night and day prayer. It's what wars and establishes God's presence and his throne in the heavenlies over geographic regions and geographic areas. Right? So letter G, let's get letter G here in page 2. And so the timing indicator of the restoration of the tabernacle of David. And so in verse 11 of Amos 9, he says that he will raise up the fallen booth of the tabernacle of David. That is a clear timing indicator for us when he does that. Because what's connected to it is the salvation of the Arabs, the salvation of Israel, the restoration of Israel. Thank you. Like all these things are connected to that and it has not yet happened. But it will. It's a ti clear timing indicator, meaning this. The ministry, the values, and the vision of the tabernacle of David will start and be heightened when Israel is brought back into their land. The restoration of night and day prayer will help usher in the planting of Israel and their finality to their land in which they will not be rooted out again. Okay. And, and so when the spirit, the spirit of the tabernacle of David, the same principle and idea is released and restored, it will begin this last, last day's end time movement with the, the uh, salvation of the Arabs and the salvation of the Jews. Okay, and it's a clear timing indicator. All right, let's look at page, um, let's go to page three. Now let's turn to Acts 15. This is where we have to understand Romans, uh, not Romans, Amos 9, to, to really appreciate, understand Acts 15. Okay? Acts 15. And, and in Acts 15, as Paul was traveling and preaching the gospel and about salvation by grace, you had the Judaizers that were coming in the book of Acts and the New Testament that would come behind them and say, no, you can't just be saved. To be saved, you have to be circumcised or you have to follow the law of Moses so that you could be saved. And so a great, it says a great debate and dissension arose among them. And really the question is this. Are we saved by grace alone or are we saved by or grace and works? Meaning, are we, do we have to keep the law of Moses to be saved or is the finished work of Christ alone enough? And so that's the primary question. There's a little bit more on here that you can see. And so in Acts 15 verse 1, it says, some men came from down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. I mean, so clear. They're trying to draw them back into the old system of Judaism or to bring them back under the law. In verse 5, it's, he says it again, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Right? And so here, this is the clear question, the clear issue that they're debating. And because of this, they sent Paul uh, and Barnabas back to Jerusalem with the elders and the apostles to go figure it out. <laughs> you know, going, let's go back and discuss this, letter B, the count, and we call this the Council of Jerusalem, Acts 15. In verse 2, it says, And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension, and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. Okay, so they bring them, bring them together, the leadership, and says, you know, what did Jesus teach us and what does the Bible say? Do Gentiles specifically, do Gentiles have to keep the law of Moses to be saved? That's the question that they're asking. Well, they come together, page four. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick. So they come together. Peter stands up. Okay, Peter, right, the great apostle. He stands up and he says, he says in verse 11, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus in the same way as they are also. Meaning he stands up and says that, he goes, I was at Cornelius' house, he's referencing Acts 10, and he says the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles like the Holy Spirit fell on us Jews in Acts 2. And so the Gentiles were saved just like we were saved. The Jews didn't do anything, okay? They were saved by grace, 
by God's intervention. He says, the, the Gentiles are saved the same way. And this is what he witnessed in his, tra in his journeys, his missionary journeys. And he's testifying and sharing about that. And his conclusion is that they are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus the same way we are. Okay, that's Peter's uh, testimony. And then it says, they're silent and they're waiting. <laughs> you know, like, you're like, wasn't Peter enough? <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, you're like, so anyway, I guess not that funny. It's funny to me. <laughs> so, okay, and so then, then James stands up. Okay, James arises now, and James answers the same question because there wasn't a consensus or there wasn't an agreement yet. And this is really fascinating in, in, in Acts 15. Starting in verse 13, James says, After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon, or Peter, has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for, for his name. And he's saying, this is what Peter was saying and describing and telling us. And he says, and, and, and James says, listen to me. In verse 15, he says, With this, the words of the prophets agree. So they're going back to the Old Testament, to, the, to their Bible in their day. They're going back into the Bible and says, this is exactly what the prophets said. That the Gentiles would be saved by grace. Okay? And, and then he goes, and starting in verse 16 through 18, or 16, really 16 and 17, he quotes Amos 9, verse 11 and 12. Okay? He says, uh, verse 15, with this the prophets, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Verse 16, after these things, I will return and I will re rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and the Gentiles who are called by his name, says the Lord who makes these things known from long ago. Okay? And so James arises and goes, this is right. What Peter was saying, it's what the prophets agreed, quotes Amos 9, verse 11 and 12, which we looked at about the tabernacle of David. And then the consensus, they all agree and says, yes, this is right. And, they, and then the answer that they give out is they write a letter that they send out and says that don't burden the Gentiles other than don't, don't eat things sacrificed to idols and don't have fornication, right? Don't do that, but everything else is okay. You don't have to work to, to receive your salvation. Okay, that's the storyline. Now let's hone in here on verse uh, 15. Because a, couple, a lot of things are really interesting here. One is this. He says, with this, the words of the prophets agree, meaning it's, the, it's multiple prophets. And yet he only quotes one prophet. Right? He only quotes Amos. But he says the words of the prophets agree, meaning I think it's the consensus of the Old Testament promises that the prophets spoke from long ago that the Gentiles would be saved. It's actually in the law as well that the Gentiles would be saved. Now, what's really interesting, follow the story, follow the logic. He's going, he's talking about the Gentiles being saved, and then he goes and quotes about the restoration of the tabernacle of David. And the question would be, what does the tabernacle of David have anything to do with the Gentiles being saved? He could have quoted so many other passages right, that the prophets and the law spoke about. Yet, from the mind of God and God's perspective, the apostolic perspective, when they're looking at the Gentiles being saved, they're connecting it to the promise of what the night and day prayer does, or the tabernacle of David. Right? you got to look at it from heaven's perspective, from God's perspective. We wouldn't go, yeah, the Gentiles are being saved, right? And he, but they're going, let's talk about the, the tabernacle of David, the restoration of it. Because the restoration of the tabernacle of David is the fuel for the salvation of the Gentiles in its fullness. Acts 10 and here, in Acts 15, was only the beginning point of the Gentiles coming in. But there is a fullness of the Gentiles that will yet come, and then the fullness of the Gentiles will be saved in the millennial kingdom. And when God looks at it, and he's answering this question, 
You got to think about it through his perspective. This is an odd passage to quote. I mean, no one really, really heard of Amos 9. No one talks about it. And yet, his perspective is an Amos going, how do we address, how do we understand what we're seeing in first century Israel with the Gentiles coming in? And immediately, James goes, this is exactly the promise of Amos 9. Because night and day prayer, the restoration of the tabernacle of David, is directly connected to the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. And so when he talks about the restoration of the tabernacle of David and the spirit of that and how it operates, here's the exciting part. Beloved, this is our generation. We're witnessing it. We're actually living out this promise of what's happening in its infancy. It hasn't even been finally fulfilled yet. Meaning, He says this is the prophetic promise or the catalyst of how the Gentiles will come, the great harvest of souls will come through this catalyst of night and day worship and prayer. That's how the apostles saw it. That's how God saw it through the scriptures. And he gives us this understanding and this promise here in Acts 15. All right? Let's look at it a little bit more here because he says this in Acts 15. He says, verse 16 says this, after these things, I will return. Meaning, he says, after these things, he's going, what things? It's the, the salvation of the Gentiles is what they're talking about. And after these things, after the salvation of the Gentiles has come about, or is coming about, and we know from uh, Acts 10 till now, it's been increasing, okay? Until in Romans 11, the fullness of the Gentiles will come in, says it's going to increase unto that point. And so he's talking about, and right now, still 40% of the world is unevangelized. Okay? And so it still has a lot of room to go and will increase. And here, James says, after these things, or after the, the salvation of the Gentiles, Jesus says, I will return. Very interesting that he will return, meaning he's already come and he's coming again. He inserts that. that. Obviously, that wasn't in Amos 9. He inserts this, and it gives us an understanding of when this is going to happen. He says, the Gentiles are coming in. Jesus will return. And when he returns, he says, he, I, will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen. Now, when you look at the Old Testament storyline and its promises, like in Ezekiel 40 through 48, what you start seeing is that there is a millennial temple that will be rebuilt when he returns. And in that millennial temple, he will, he will bring forth the offices of the kingship, because Jesus will be king of kings, lord of lords over the entire earth, with the prayer room or the priestly ministry. He'll restore these two offices back together together. It's, it's a Zechariah chapter 6 is what it talks, when it talks about that, this promise together. And he's saying when he returns, he will rebuild the prayer room or the tabernacle of David when he comes back, and he will rule the nations from that place. And part of his rulership is he will rebuild the tabernacle of David, and in doing so, there will still be salvations yet to come in the millennial kingdom. Because not all the, all the Gentiles are not fully saved. Okay? There's still people alive in the millennial kingdom. There's still people being born in the millennial kingdom. And there's still death in the millennial kingdom. Okay. Right? And so that's a whole, another topic. But, you know, that, but it's true. I mean, it's in the scriptures. It's true. And so people will still be saved in the millennial, millennial kingdom. And so what it tells us is that the, the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David is actually what Jesus will do. He'll be the architect of it. It'll be glorious, I'm sure. Okay, And he will rebuild it. And when he does, it will be for the purpose of bringing in the rest of the Gentiles during the millennial age. Now, some people in Amos 9, what they say is this. When they read it, they go, well, the, tabernacle, the restoration of the tabernacle of David is actually Jesus himself. He's the restoration of the tabernacle of David. Okay? And that, that's their interpretation. Many commentators, when you read it, uh, Amos 9, will, very evangelical ones will say that. 
but when you interpret it in Acts 15, the tabernacle of David in, in Amos 9 cannot be Jesus because Jesus won't rebuild himself all right, in Acts 15. Instead, it's talking about the physical building, the ministry, the values of night and day prayer is what is, what, uh, is talked about in Acts 15 and what's met, referenced in Amos 9. You guys follow me? Yes? No? Okay. And so it's saying, I put a note there in case, so you guys can read it. But, right, and so the interpretation, it's not, because some will say, oh yeah, God will restore the tabernacle of David. It's going to be Jesus himself. It's just Jesus. Every, Jesus is the, like the fulfillment of everything. He is, but there's more to just Jesus being everything. I mean, that's, that's a bad way of putting it. But, you know, like, he uses process, he uses ministries and people, and really, the idea of the tabernacle of David, it will be a stand, it will be a freestanding entity in itself. Okay, it's not Jesus himself. Okay? All right, let's look at page five. And so, when the tabernacle of David was restored, it's a restoration of Davidic worship and the prayer movement. Okay, just put it simply, it's the restoration of Davidic worship and the prayer movement. And this is the key to, in which the Gentiles and the Arabs and the rest of mankind, it says, will be saved. Okay? Now, it, it officially happens when Jesus comes back. That's when he's going to restore it. But that same spirit of the, rest of the tabernacle of David is being released in our generation right now. We're witnesses of it. We're watching it. Okay? There's never been more prayer globally, more worship and prayer than now. Right? I mean, they say there's 10,000 prayer rooms around the world, mostly uh, in other nations, other continents, other than America. You know? in, in uh, underground China and Africa, okay? Asia, there's different places. One, there's just more people. There's more believers right now okay, than ever before. Okay? Just very simple math. The other is they've been, there's this, uh, stirring by the Holy Spirit for night and day worship and prayer in different formats. Okay, I'm sure you guys know this, but like when IHOP started in 99, 1999, there are two other global movements that started. One in England, actually in Europe, in England, but it was different. It was more of the Moravian style worship and prayer, where one person would come into a room, they would spend an hour, you know, uh, ministering, praying, singing, worshiping, whatever they did. And then when their hour was up, the next person came in for an hour. And so it was like a, uh, what's it called, marathon or whatever, you know, where you just, a what? A relay. A relay, yeah, a relay. <laughs> okay. It was like a relay where, you know, you pass the baton on one to another, but it didn't stop. All right. That was more of the Moravian style. That's what they, what they did. All right. And so it wasn't worth worship and prayer like this, though they had worship or, you know, they have a nice room. Okay. That happened there. There was another movement in the, in the charismatic Catholics okay, at the same time. And the charismatic Catholics that started around, the, they didn't know each other. They just, the Lord put it, stirred it, and that's what they did. And it started, they believe there's other movements. They believe there's one in South America on a, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, what? One of the mountains? Yeah, like a mountain, not a mountain, but it's a, uh, what? Yeah, it's, I, I can't remember the word for it. But it started there. So later, like years later, they found each other and said, hey, we've been doing this. And they're like, we're doing the same thing. And we're doing the same thing. And the Lord sovereignly began to stir this. Right? And the reason is because when he returns, this is his model. This is his pattern. This is what he will do. Okay? And before he comes, there is, is coming this uh, harvest of nations and really, to, for the harvest of nations to come, it takes worship and prayer and unprecedented levels and the outpouring of the Spirit and God's movement to break uh, ancient strongholds. I mean, you look at Islam, you're not going to just go in and break that stronghold. You know? I mean, you're not going to go, you know, I don't know how long Islam has been around, uh, since the 700s, something like that, 1400s. Yeah, 1,300, yeah. Sorry. So, you know, you're not going to just go in, and they pray five times a day, and there's 1.9 billion of them right now. 
you know, whether their hearts are in it actually doesn't matter. Okay? Whether they, how much they believe actually doesn't matter. It's the choices, the actions they make to come and to open their mouth and say the, pray, say the stuff. It fuels demonic strongholds. Okay? It fuels it. Okay? You're calling on a false god. You're calling on the devil. Okay? And imagine that many people for that many years... And then here's, you know, Johnny come lately with, you know, his little Bible and going, I'm going to go into, you know, the Middle East. And it's like, it's a war, okay? It's not that Jesus doesn't have power, but there's ways in God, okay? And so it's like, and so just to come in and go, we're going to break open the Middle East, you know, just because I'm saved and I have a little fire now. Like, we don't know what, you, they don't know what they're getting into, okay? And so God has this strategy of little groups, but they're, Fighting in the right way, according to God's strategy, where he will release his presence, his power. And as prayer rooms are established, and they're, and they're small and they're weak, what are the, the testimonies are this, God's visiting the Muslims in unprecedented ways. Okay? And so this is his strategy. All right, let's look at Roman numeral three, and we'll end with this. And so I wanted to, just conclude it with this, talking about who we are. I was, just, I was talking to somebody the other day, and I was just, we were just talking about church and this and that and different things. And, and I, th I thought, you know, who are we? And we? But we're a little bit different than a local church, okay? And there's nothing wrong with being, and we are a local church. And a local church just means you're a spiritual family, you're growing, you're serving, you know, you're discipling, you're evangelizing, you do all of those you know, you have, you have eldership, spiritual authority, all of that. And that's important, all right? And so there's nothing wrong with that. But this spirit of the tabernacle of David, I'll tell you, it's essential, okay? It's essential for what God wants to do. And around that idea or that principle, right, comes with it this vision and values of the spirit of the tabernacle of David. Okay? And that's where we're different you know, and or that's what we're called to. It's our assignment. It's not better than, it's just this is what we're called to. Because I was talking to those, like, what burns in your heart? Like, what's the passions of your heart? Right? Like, when I, talk, when I talk about the outpouring of the Spirit, we talk about salvation of Arabs, we talk about Israel, you know, we talk about night and day prayer and seeing the glory of God, that's what stirs my heart. All right? And it's not that I don't care about families and children and your marriage and... You know, like, you know, I, we care about all those things. I'm not saying, as a local church, okay, you do. And you counsel, you do small groups, you do all of that thing. But I go, beloved, there is something greater than that. He loves you. We love you, okay? He loves you. But, I love you. But, like, you know, what stirs in your heart? Okay? And, um, and so it's this, it's this part of the visions and values of the spirit of the tabernacle of David. And so I just put three things here. It's really what it means is it's a missions base. One is night and day prayer. Okay? The distinction is this, night and day prayer, meaning ministry to the Lord and prophetic intercession. Okay, ministry to the Lord and prophetic intercession. I mean, as a, the church in America especially is, lo is losing this or has lost it. Okay? Uh, and, and, I'm, it's just, and so ministry to the Lord, prophetic intercession. Number two, it's this missional assignment, meaning... We're engaging in missions. Think about the spirit of the tabernacle of David. It's about the Arabs and Israel being saved. All of mankind being saved. It's very missional. Now, how do we engage in that from a prayer room? And I say it's two ways. One is we engage in missions from the place of prayer. Okay, meaning we're pr this is how we started in the Middle East. For two years, we prayed for the Middle East. We didn't know anybody. We didn't know anything or anybody, you know? And, and so, like, but the Lord put it on our hearts, so what do we do? We start praying for it. Just weekly, we just start praying for it, okay? And then the Lord started opening the doors and making connections and giving us understanding. And so, one, is we engage in missions from the place of prayer. And two, we go, as the Lord leads, we go to these places. Uh, I mean, it's all over the world, but for us, it's specifically that Middle Eastern 1040 window in Israel, that, that place there, the Arab nations. And I believe it's specific in this way that the Arab nations, God will use them to provoke Israel to jealousy. 
God will use them to provoke Israel to jealousy, and he will use them to protect Israel from persecution that's coming. Okay, both of those are critical and crucial. Okay, probably a little different. Because, okay? we, yes, we love the entire world, and we want to send you know, laborers everywhere. But when you look at the end of the age and the storyline of what's coming, it's strategic. It focuses in on Jerusalem, Israel, and the Middle East. Okay, very clear. Okay? And so it's like, why is that? And why is God raising up people for that area? And so it's very missional, this missional assignment. And the third is the central focus on Israel. Her salvation, her restoration, and her comfort as God fulfills his covenants to her. You see this in Isaiah 40, right? The, the forerunner message where it begins, comfort, comfort my people. Because right? there's a day coming where she, she needs comfort now, but it will be far worse for her in the days to come. Okay? And it tells, you, it tells us in Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people, tell to her that her warfare has ended. I mean, there's warfare that's coming against her, way more than what's coming right now. And the central focus on Israel, okay, uh, along with the Arabs, and the night and day prayer. Okay? That, that, that's very missional. It's the missions base. And so I think that's a little bit, that's different for us. And then let her see, it's the forerunner message. And so the restoration of the tabernacle of David, it really is an end time move of God. Okay? Just the timing of it, it's an end time move of God. And so with that comes this forerunner message that's specifically uh, about preparing the church and the nations for the return of Jesus and the events and the dynamics that are associated with it. Okay? And so when I think of the, this, this forerunner message, I mean, we have it on our wall here, Jesus is bridegroom, king, and judge. This reality that Jesus is a bridegroom and the church is a bride and will operate in that idea encompasses the first commandment. It encompasses the intimacy message and the revelation of Jesus as a bridegroom. Right? It's that he's a king, meaning he's going to bring salvation, the fullness of his uh, purposes for all of the harvesting of the nations as a king with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That Joel 2, Acts 2 outpouring as a king, this is what he will pour out. Right? Third, he's a judge, meaning the temporal judgments of God are coming to the earth. And this is probably the, the one that's not well understood the best, you know, or least understood. That's a better way to put it. It's probably least understood. And the most offensive and confusing is that the temporal judgments of God are coming to the earth. And yet it's coming because of the strongholds that are in the earth right now, both in the church actually and in the world, he's going to shake it free. That's what the judgments do. The judgments actually shake open the grip of the strongholds that are in the church and in the world. Okay? And there's a lot that can be said there. But he's transitioning and shifting the earth and preparing it for his son to come. And it's these simple three, not simple, these three revelations of Jesus, bridegroom, king, and judge, it encompasses so many things that's on his heart. And this really is the understanding and the preparation that we need for these hours. And that's, that's a, that message is so different. Right? That's not a Sunday morning message or a Saturday night message that you'll hear a lot. Saturday night because we're Saturday night. Get it? We're, we're normal. 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 Okay. And so, you know, but that message, it's missing, you know, from American Christianity. Okay. And the Lord is bringing, raising up forerunners because when he begins to shake, the illusion of, of what you see of American Christianity is going to crumble. That illusion is going to crumble. Okay? And I'm not saying it's good or bad or whatever. I'm not making judgment. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, it's like it's going to crumble because that's not what he's after. Right? There is a purity, a foundation of intimacy, of the revelation of God, uh, the scriptures, I mean, just so many things. Uh, when we start the new year, I actually want to start with a series on the Sermon of the Mount, okay, on, on uh, the Beatitudes and the Sermon of the Mount, because as things begin to shake more and more, 
I go, the Sermon on the Mount values and the Beatitudes, this is what he's after. The reason he's shaking is to actually, one, to allow those attitudes and heart values to come forth, and two, for them to be established more. Okay? And so, I mean, it says, Peter says, he's going to shake the church first. Judgment starts in the house of God. And Haggai says, and, and Hebrews 12 says, he's going to shake the nations. I mean, everything we know will be shaken. Only the things built on Christ, that Matthew 7, built on Christ, will survive and last. All right? And so it's like, this is what he's about. And so these three revelations of Jesus as bridegroom, king, and judge, it's so important and foundational to the forerunner message. And so just in summary, this is what we're about. When we talk about the house of prayer, I mean, we looked at it in so many different ways right now, from the Old Testament, from the restoration, right, to the prophetic declarations and what he's going to do. Just reflecting on it, going, man, we're living in the days when this is happening in its infancy. I mean, that's amazing that we're living in the days when the prophets were prophesying about the restoration of the tabernacle of David. It hasn't fully happened yet, but in its infancy, in its spirit of it, it's happening right now. And not only is it happening, I'm like, Lord, thank you. You called us into it. And we get to do it. And we're part of it. And we're not only here, but then now we're, you know, we're going into Israel and the Middle East and all of that. It's like, it's amazing to watch this uh, fabric, you know, the tapestry of his plans coming together. And we have like a front row view of it. Right? I go, I, it just amazes me. I mean, no one knows us here, which is okay. And you're looking going, Lord, thank you for like what you're doing. And so I just want to encourage us with that and going, just give some, give some, um, clarity or some verbiage to like who are we because people will ask you know, are you a church you know are you a missions base like what's the house of prayer what do you do you know and it's like as i was talking to this person i was like yeah we're a local church i think that's the foundation of everything okay and, and local churches are great and, and they're needed and what they do i don't want to minimize that so, and, and, but i was like but there's another place where he's going no there are bigger things that he's bringing about in the nations with, you know, the missions base, with night and day prayer, with the forerunner message that's absolutely necessary for the days coming, right, as he begins to shake. And so that's who we are. So, all right, let's stand together. All right, let's just, let's just pray and ask the Lord for his blessing. As we end this year and we start getting into 2024, we're really excited for, this, for the things that God is doing. Now, every year, he's accelerating. Like, he really is accelerating his work on the earth. And beloved, we get to be we're part of it. And in our own little spheres and the things he does, he's invited us and when we're part of it. And it's amazing to see. So, Holy Spirit, come now, Lord, and just rest on us. Lord, come and encourage us. Come and strengthen us. Come and speak to us. Come and put these stakes of, of prophetic truth and promises inside of us. That you would write these promises of Haggai, of Amos. Lord, so much more. that you would do the suddenlies both in our lives and that you would do the suddenlies in our city and in the nations. Lord, for your kingdom's sake, that these things would come about suddenly, the fulfillment of them. And Lord, for each of us, God, let there be places of ownership where we don't just hear it, but God, we lay a hold of it in our own lives to whatever degree it is and whatever role we play. Lord, that we would lay a hold of it For all different ages, Lord, let there be this ownership of your prophetic promises. I think this is really important because it's not just for this house. It's 
for what he's doing in the earth than he will do. And some of you guys will stay here and some of you will be gone. It, you know, wherever he sends you and points you. But it's amazing. Wherever you go, if you own it, you believe in it, like the Lord will use you in those places. And it's one big picture, one big family. Right? Really, this, this house of prayer missions, when you look at those two together, it is such a small community, especially the Middle East. It's such a small community. And wherever we labor, it's like, Lord, let us labor with this in mind. To see the fulfillment. And so, Lord, come right now, whatever area we need. Lord, whether it's vision, understanding, questions we have. Lord, truths you want to impart, grace that we need. Lord, maybe it's direction and a, and a, and a nation or people group. Lord, or the next steps, we say, Lord, come and speak to us right now. Lord, we give ourselves to you and the path you've opened up. And so, Lord, come and speak to us in this. You speak to things that are near and you speak to things that are far. You do both. And that's your prerogative. It's up to you. Lord, just speak to us about how we fit in to your house of prayer. Lord, this, what you're doing through the nations, not just here, whether it's here or other places, Lord, speak to us, God, about how we fit into your plans. Let's say it's your house, it's your plans, it's your kingdom, Lord. And so, Lord, speak to us. And so let's just gather, you know, pray and small groups together, two or three, and let's just bless each other, especially as the new year is coming. And I know people need direction, they need, they need encouragement, you know, for whatever it is, let's just pray for each other. Maybe this is the question, Lord, how do we, I fit in to the house of prayer?